Thank you, Father. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I am going to come to the living wage, um, not, not as a matter of economics or public policy, but as something that's really important. I do think that that's the way forward. And so I'm, I'm, I have a bachelor's degree in economics, not a PhD, so I'm at a great disadvantage when having this discussion. Um, but I want to start with a story, and it's a story of hope. For each of the last eight years, my family and I have made the decision to go and do volunteer community service in Peru. And we did this, actually, my wife and I, as a means of ripping our two daughters, now in their 20s, out of Silicon Valley. And the wealth that we knew they were going to encounter as their friends drove Mercedes-Benz automobiles and had other luxuries, and how in the world could our children have a perspective on the world and their responsibility growing up in those conditions. And so by serendipity or providence, we ended up in this tiny town of Piura, P-I-U-R-A, Peru, which is about a two-hour flight north of Lima. And it's in the middle of the desert. And it's become quite addictive for us. We go back every year. Um, and in eight years that I've been there, I've never once seen a tourist. Because there's no reason a tourist would ever think to go there. And yet it's become a second home for us. And here's the story. The very first day that I was there, we took the flight from Lima. We flew from San Francisco, Los Angeles, Los Angeles, Lima, landed Lima at midnight. And the connecting flight to Piura was 4.30 in the morning. So we just hung out in the airport terminal. And so we caught the 4.30 a.m. flight, and people picked us up at this tiny airport. We were the only airplane that showed up at Piura that day. And uh, they took us to the church where we stayed. Uh, not part of a formal mission. We were just there. And uh, there were volunteer opportunities, one of which was to help a local community of 100 indigent farmers harvest their Pima cotton crop. So that's the very first thing I did. And I came prepared. I had a hat and sunglasses and a water bottle. And they drove me out in a pickup truck on the sandy dirt roads. And I got out to the field. And uh, it's a field unlike any field. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, right? So I know a cornfield when I see it. Uh, these were very poorly performing farms. It didn't take an ag ex expert to realize that. But I got out in the field and got down on my hands and knees and started harvesting the Pima cotton. And I looked around the field, and there were these huge, browned out spots, nothing growing. On the plants that I was harvesting, there were these little red bugs that were eating the cotton and eating me and eating the poor farmers. And their kids, the farmers' kids, from the time they're five years old, are working in the fields. They don't go to school. And the families don't live in a home. And they don't have enough food. And I was then a partner at a venture capital firm on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park. And the contrast was staggering just absolutely staggering. And so we uh, completed our time down there. We do many other things when we're down there. We work in a hospice, an orphanage, deliver food, um, visit prisoners in the prison. Uh, it's really just a photocopy of Matthew 25 is what we do, and it's a beautiful thing for us. And uh, I told friends back here of the stories of what we had seen, what we had encountered. And a friend of mine said, I think I've got an idea for your farmers. I've got a friend who's an agricultural expert. He lives in Lima. Here's his phone number. So I cold called this fellow, Tony Salas. Told him what I was looking at. I said, I don't know where to, where to begin to diagnose the problem. We want to help the farmers. I don't know what to do. I'm going to be down again in June. Would you come and just spend a day with me in the fields and try to break down the problem? And he did that. Sight unseen, didn't know me, on his own nickel. And so we walked the fields. Um, I speak Spanish well enough to understand what was being said. And at the end of the, the half, half a day, he says, OK, I want all 100 farmers in that warehouse in 30 minutes. And he stood up in front of the farmers and said, I have two things to tell you. The first is, you're growing the wrong crop. The second is, you're growing it the wrong way. And so uh, through a collaboration, we helped the farmers transition from Pima cotton to green beans. They had their first harvest in four months. We're on the equator. 
and that tripled their annual income. So my, my new friend, my new best friend, Tony Salas, has a really uh, catchy phrase, which is when he talks about the poor, he says they're poor, they're not stupid. And so that has been a transformational event in my life and the lives of our families, of my family. And I want to come back to some of the comments that were made earlier by um, His Eminence, who quoted from Evangelii Gaudium, and the phrase, the sentence in the exhortation that stays with me is, we must let the poor evangelize us. Father Thompson told us that St. Francis said, it is in the giving that we receive, or words like that. I'm now the president of the St. Vincent de Paul Society for San Mateo County. Our mission is homelessness and poverty. And here's the thing. Every year in San Mateo County, we take care of between 30 and 40,000 poor people in some form or fashion, not 24-7, some 24-7, some a lunch, some monthly care, 30 or 40,000 people. That's a lot of people. Notwithstanding that, our main mission as an organization is not to help the poor. That's a secondary objective. The mission of the St. Vincent de Paul Society is the spiritual growth and transformation of our volunteers through the person-to-person -person service of the poor. And so what I want to share with you is my belief that there is an eternal formula that's an immutable characteristic of creation, just like gravity and the speed of light, which is we grow in having a personal encounter with the poor. And I have felt that myself. So uh, during and after my visits to Peru, when I do my work at St. Vincent de Paul on the other side of the bay, there's a sense of fulfillment I've never had in my life. There's a sense of perspective I've not had in my life. And there's a sense of meaning and purpose in my life I don't get in my, day, my former day job. And I believe that that's an immutable characteristic of humanity. And we just have to go out and find it. So let me share with you now, that was a story of hope. 100 farmers, average family size, five or six, five or 600 people lifted out of extreme poverty. Just through an insight and a little bit of capital, not very much. It's not a matter of economics. It's not a matter of public policy. It's finding an opportunity. That's what it is. And so here's a story of despair. So that's, that's a story of hope from the bottom of the pyramid. 6,000 miles away. Here's a story of despair from 40 miles away across the bay. Every day, we serve food. It's a soup kitchen. San Mateo, 50 North B Street, come visit us. And what's happened in America, what's happened in Silicon Valley, what's happened in San Mateo, is globalization, yes, has lifted a people, a billion people but it's also hollowed out the middle class in the United States of America. And so the people that we have show up there come from uh, all walks of life. But the fact of the matter is there's not an opportunity, a meaningful opportunity to earn a living wage. And my point is a minimum wage is not a living wage because a minimum wage doesn't provide dignity. And we see that every day. So people with jobs, people without jobs are showing up at our soup kitchen and we're very driven to uh, find a way to provide living wages uh, to people in our community. So my history is uh, undergrad degree in economics, uh, a law degree, practiced law, was a partner in a large law firm in California uh, for many years, uh, became a, an investment banker, and then a venture capitalist at the venture capital firm where I was a partner. I was a co-founder and co-ran a green growth fund, a sustainability fu fund focused on investing in entrepreneurs with sustainability solutions, how to make the economy and the world more sustainable, uh, companies at the growth stage. I retired from that a year and a half ago because I was elected as the president of the St. Vincent de Paul Society and I felt that as a calling. And as president, I'm not compensated. Executive directors receive compensation, presidents don't. 
but I could, and so I did decide to uh, leap headlong into that opportunity. And it's, uh, it is in the giving that I receive. When I retired from, uh, from my firm, uh, the very first phone call I made was to my friend Tony Salas. Uh, Tony Salas is the fellow in Lima, Peru, who helped me and helped us figure out the problems with the poor farmers. And I called Tony and I said, you have to scale what you're doing. Because Tony has come up with an innovative business model that will both create large returns for investors and lift people out of poverty. And it's this mixed model that I believe that Pope Francis is pointing us to. And it's called the impact economy. And Pope Francis had two seminars this summer in the Vatican. One fo focused on social enterprise, one fo focused on impact investing, and it's about a new flavor of capitalism. And so there's a third way, I believe. And so it's not the economists arguing with the public policy people, is ca capitalism bad or good? It's capitalism can have many different stripes and flavors. So let's go figure out the one that creates the incentive, the private market incentive, for increases in wealth and prosperity while taking care of others. And that's how I'm committing my life going forward. I believe it to my core. And I believe that's what Pope Francis is telling us. So when I called Tony Salas, uh, I said in, in Espanol, dude, you've got to scale what you're doing. And so he got that. And here's what he does. He goes to poor rural communities. And he himself buys up tracts of land, 50, 70 hectares, two and a half acres per hectare. Not from poor farmers. Poor farmers don't own 50 or 70 hectares. He's buying these from mid-tier farmers. And he's growing high-value specialty crops, organic bananas, red table grapes, cacao, chocolate, and things like that that are meant to create the highest yield and profit per hectare. He's very good at this. He's the former Undersecretary of Agriculture for Peru. He has his PhD in Agricultural Sciences from North Carolina State University, one of our best, and his MBA from Purdue University with an emphasis in food and agriculture, which is our best program in that category. So here's what he does. Now he's got this land that he owns, this, this farm. He goes to the surrounding community, to the indigent farmers who own one or two hectares with the following proposition. I'm here to help. I don't want to buy your farm. In fact, never sell your farm. You sell your farm, you've got nothing. What I want to do is to help convert you from the wrong crop to the right crop, or the right crop done the wrong way, to the right crop done the right way. And I'll give you the right seed or the right variety of the right crop. I'll teach you and give you the right, most advanced, sustainable farming methods. And I'll take your harvest and sell it side by side mine directly to an end user for a premium price, because you're growing the most valuable, highest quality product in its category in the world. What I ask for in return for, your ser for my services that I'm giving you is 10% of your revenue going forward. By the way, you can leave anytime you want. No contract. Walk away if you want, anytime you want. For the 90% you keep, 90% of your revenue you keep, your annual income increases somewhere between 2x and 7x. Not 20 to 70%, a doubling or sevenfold increase in your annual income. And here's the opportunity, here's the driver of the opportunity to have an impact company, a company looking to create large profits for its investors, and in the case of Tony's company called SharedX, lift 12,000 people out of extreme poverty. That's the goal of the company, both. Not one or the other, both. And that's, that's a poster child, in my opinion, for the impact economy. So that's, uh, that is SharedX. SharedX is meant to stand for a shared exchange of capital, knowledge, and prosperity. I'm the chairman of the board. Tony asked me to do that. We're out raising money right now. Um, and the thing I will tell you is the interest in the capital markets for, in, for impact ideas, impact investing, is huge and growing rapidly. It's, this is not something that you'd read about in the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith 
It's, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't, Adam Smith is, in our own selfish interest, we're here to maximize profits. But if you integrate the invisible hand of the free market, Adam Smith teaches us that, with what I would call free mercy through the invisible hand of the Holy Spirit, it is in the giving that we receive. If we bring those two together, I think we can make that happen. Let me tell you a couple, just a brief, a couple, briefly a couple things we're doing at the St. Vincent de Paul Society in the category of the impact economy. The first is something that I've named the Catalyst Program, and the Catalyst Program is meant to expand the number of jobs for the marginalized paying a living wage. That's the goal of the program, and we do it by accelerating the success of impact companies. How do we do that? We have gone around Silicon Valley and spoken with a lot of venture capitalists and successful entrepreneurs with the following proposition. You serve as a member of the board of directors of three or five or seven companies. Would you consider adding one more company to the mix? And not a semiconductor company, not a social networking company, maybe a food service company or a silk screening business or an outsourced outsource box manufacturer. And what we want you to do is to adopt that company and will it to success using everything in your power, your funding networks, your talent networks, your networks with potential customers, your ability to write a strategic plan. Instead of trying to create the next Facebook or in addition to that, help one of these companies that provide blue collar jobs. Here's the thing I want to tell you. It is the giving that we receive. Every, to date, every single person I've made that pitch to has said, absolutely, I'll do that. Every single person. Why didn't somebody ask me before? It's what I do well. It's what I enjoy doing. I'd love to help create jobs. And the goal is to create those jobs not at a minimum wage. There's no dignity in that. At a living wage. So then we're going to companies in the community and saying, we have the thing that you need the most for your business to succeed. It's a world-class CEO mentor. We're going to give that mentor to you for free if you commit for some fraction of your workforce as you grow and succeed that those jobs will go locally here to the marginalized at a living wage. And the companies are saying yes. Because from an Adam Smith perspective, the trade-off is they now have the chance to grow. Their company can grow much faster with this resource than without, and they're giving up a little bit of profit margin. And they like that trade. And so it's this kind of innovation, and there are other examples at St. Vincent de Paul, two or three other examples, where we are trying to propel forward and evangelize the impact economy as a third way. So I want to say, and I see Father Michael is mindful of the time. <clears throat> I'll only take another half an hour, I promise. Uh, it, I, think, I think the way to think about capitalism is it's not one flavor, it's many flavors. And we can, by us working together, direct towards a different, uh, a different way, a third way. I want to close with this. Um, two years ago, there was a ship with uh, poor people on board that left Africa aiming to go to Europe because the poor people who decided to put their life savings into getting on this ship would have a better life in Europe than in Africa. And they didn't make it. In a big storm on the Mediterranean, the ship sunk. Everybody aboard died, just outside of Lampedusa, Italy. Pope Francis came there the following month. And in his remarks, he asked a question. Who is responsible for the deaths of these people? Who is responsible? There's a pregnant pause. And he answered his own question. Nobody. Nobody's responsible for the deaths of these people. And that's just the problem. And so I find hope in the Dominican order gathering like this. I find hope in the impact economy, in Pope Francis bringing people to the Vatican, in Bill Gates 
turning from, I'm going to say it this way, because it was true years ago, a rapacious monopolist to a phenomenal philanthropist. And I think the world is changing this way. If you look at the younger generations in our MBA programs, they're demanding impact content in their courses. Yale University, the business school, there are 95% of their classes have impact content in it per student demand. Not the professors, the students. So uh, from my perspective, in given what I'm doing in my life now, more and more I take hope because more and more I see people embracing and living the preferential option for the poor. And I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.